The Apostolic Approach Part 3. This ev has evolved into a series. There's still more to talk about. We may just turn this into a book one day because it's like this thought that just kind of keeps going. And I'm like, well, you know, I don't know when to end and when not to. So we may come back to it. Part 4 may be in a month or so. I don't know. It's just a really interesting uh, idea that is all throughout Scripture, primarily the book of Acts. And that's where they go back to the beginning. How did it start at the beginning? How did it start? What happened when it started? Well, that's how we know it's real. So we've talked about it. Um, we've talked about baptism and filling of the Holy Ghost. How the early church viewed Jesus, uh, that he was not some second person of a three-person Godhead, but um, that, you know, he was the Lord from heaven manifest in flesh and all of those things. But there's one other thing I want to touch on with this uh, tonight. And so we know that there's a lot of great lessons to be learned from the book of Acts. It's an incredible book. It's kind of underrated, I think, in the, the broad umbrella of uh, Christianity. Uh, some denominations don't really recognize it at all. And I don't understand that if you believe that this whole thing is the infallible word of God. And then you have other groups that put a lot of emphasis on it in the sense uh, of they put <laughs> specific emphasis really on just certain parts of the book of Acts. But I, I think the best approach is to just everybody calm down. Let's just look at the whole historical account for what it is and let the word speak to us. Because um, that's how you approach the whole Bible, so the same thing should be the book of Acts. Um, some of those lessons are salvation, evangelism, community, and fellowship. There's an incredible uh, spirit of unity in that early church, and um, they obviously met weekly um, in different settings, large settings, small settings, but they were, they were a community, and so... Um, they had that fellowship mentality. And so we, those are the three main areas that the book of Acts is known for. Salvation, Acts 2.38, evangelism, you just, every chapter is talking about their evangelistic efforts. And then fellowship, which is the end of Acts 2. They broke bread. People have kind of misinterpreted that too as eating. And that's breaking bread is kind of more lending itself to the Lord's Supper. They ate their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, so they ate meals together. But that breaking of bread is really referring more to the Lord's Supper. But um, we're not going to stop eating together. Everybody say amen. We're still going to do that. So, But um, I'm just going to have to take it easy on our next friend's giving with those carbs. Too many carbs. Just, I don't know why I... Did macaroni and cheese, mashed potatoes and gravy, and stuffing. Like, what was I thinking? I mean, I know we do that. I mean, that's part of the culture. But what happened to us? When? How did we fall apart? But, so, anyway. However, when one thinks of the book of Acts, this historical account of the early church, I don't hear this one topic referred to very much when referring to the book of Acts. And that is prayer. I don't think that I hear it talked about that much when referring to Acts, like the book of Acts, I think of prayer, but we should. Uh, the book of Acts is filled with examples of prayer, results of prayer, and stories unfolding revolving around prayer. So with that in mind, we need to actually kind of stop for a minute and look at we want the results of the book of Acts. We want to see the lifestyle of the book of Acts, right? But we need to ask the question, how did they get there? How did they see those results? How did they turn their world upside down? How did they experience such supernatural things? Prayer. The church actually would not be in existence without first prayer. The birth of the church is found in Acts chapter 2. But we find in Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 12, that the apostles left um, the Mount of Olives where they watched Jesus ascend into heaven, and they went back to Jerusalem. And then when they got there, they went upstairs to the room they were staying. And we know that the 12 were there, 
or the 11, and then they appointed the 12th because of Judas. But it mentions Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas son of James. And then in verse 14 it says, They all joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. And that's what they were doing when the day of Pentecost came. And they were all together in one place. And then suddenly there comes that sound like a blowing of a violent wind that came from heaven. It filled the house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed like tongues of fire that came and separated and sat upon each of them. So it's kind of like a great ball of fire. Uh, hit the room and then dispersed. Anyway, and it cloven tongues like a fire sat upon each of them. And then it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. We know began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. But this Holy Ghost infilling is a result of prayer. Which means nobody can be filled with the Holy Ghost if they're first not praying. So nobody gets the Holy Ghost sitting there with their mouth closed. Nobody gets, we know, and I know we're beating the dead horse. Well, the alive horse because the Holy Ghost is living. But, you know, nobody gets, nobody is filled with the Holy Ghost because they get to this mental condition where they uh, have a spiritual experience. That's fine. You can have spiritual experiences and not be filled with the Holy Ghost. You can have experiences with the Spirit of God and still not be filled with the Holy Ghost. Because there's a difference between the Holy Ghost coming on you and the Holy Ghost filling you. There's a difference. And so, uh, I see lots of people that experience the Holy Ghost, but they're not filled with it. They'll be moved to tears. They'll be broken. They'll be buckled over. They'll Some of them fall to the floor because the power of the Holy Ghost hits them. They're still not filled. Because Jesus said, out of your belly will flow a river of living water. This spake he of the Spirit. We see that, uh, that kind of um, mysterious language that Jesus states in John 7. We see what it looks like in Acts 2. And we know that, but that was a result of prayer. Here's another one, Acts 3. Verse 1 says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. And then they come across a man who is crippled by the gate, beautiful, and he's asking for money. And uh, Peter and John go up to him, and um, Peter looks straight at him, just like, and John did as well. And Peter said, look at us. And the man looks at him expecting to receive something, and then Peter said, I don't have any money. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Then he took him by the hand and lifted him up, and the man is made whole. And so what we see here is the man didn't need money. He needed a miracle because the money would have enabled him to continue in his crippled state. So Peter is like, I don't have any money, and money's not what you need. You don't need more money. You need a miracle. You need to be made whole. So in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Rise up and walk. But this miracle took place when they're headed to prayer. So what would have happened if Peter and John that day would have been like, you know what? Let's skip prayer today. No miracle. So we see here that because the early church, uh, their life really revolved around prayer, because they're going to go pray at 3 p.m., all of us are still working. You know, we got things to do at 3 p.m. And prayer is not one of them. You know, uh, this mindset is their life revolved around prayer. This is what it was. That's what they did, 3 p.m. It's the hour of prayer. So uh, because their life revolved around prayer, a miracle was really kind of the byproduct of it. When prayer is first in our life and in focus, miracles just kind of are the result of it. The temple, Jesus cleansed it and restored it to a house of prayer. Then the blind and the lame were made whole. So miracles really aren't that hard. They're hard when they're trying to be experienced through people 
who don't pray. I mean, why would Jesus do a miracle in the midst of a group of people that only talk to him when they want a miracle? And we see here that this miracle in Acts 3 didn't take place in the upper room. This man that was lame at the gate beautiful was not a believer. He wasn't, you know, one of the church people in the upper room that experienced the Holy Ghost. Now, we believe and we expect miracles to take place in the church. James talks about that. If you're sick, go up, get prayer. The prayer of faith will save the sick. And if he's committed any sin, it will be forgiven him. So we see that that's part of what should take place in the church. But in this example, Peter and John are on their way to pray. And they see a need. And because they're already in this mindset of prayer, they've also got faith and anticipation. And they're just kind of in a spiritual mindset. And so we see the results. Another example, Acts 4. Uh, They faced a little persecution, a little opposition. And they're starting to feel a little bit of that pressure. And um, Acts 4.31 gathered together and they're praying we read that prayer and then in verse 31 it says after they prayed the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the holy ghost and spoke the word of god boldly and then the account and the rest of acts 4 continues it says all believers were in one heart and mind no one uh claimed any possessions as their own but they just shared and it was a it was like a a community or a body so to speak, so, you know, how does that, how can we kind of understand, so to speak, what it's saying there? Well, my body doesn't, you know, say to my right hand, no, this is my blood, and this left hand can't get any of the blood. It's just like a circular thing, like, no, no part of my body is like territorial about, you know, this is my pint of blood. No, you can't have it. I mean, so, so that's kind of like how I interpret what this is saying. It's just, you know, this, uh, it, it, it uh, functioned as a body. And then in verse 33, it says, with great power, the um, apostles continued to testify of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. God's grace was working so powerfully in them all, them all. And this continued after they prayed. So they were dealing with a little bit of uh, pressure from the outside in society. And they're starting to feel that pressure. And they're like, God, we need to pray. We can't lose our boldness to speak. Boldness to speak. Not boldness to gather in the house and shout the roof down. It's boldness to speak the word of God out there. We've we've got to continue in that. And um, so they they pray for it and they get what they need. But as the narrative of chapter 4 continues, it goes then after that prayer to the apostles continue Uh, giving great power and witness of the resurrection of Jesus. And then it talks to what the the whole body did of believers. And uh, basically how we would summarize it is uh, generous or sacrificial giving. So it was like a next level of giving. And it wasn't the giving um, grudgingly. It was, you know, needs here type thing you have needs here I'll meet that need you have need here I'll meet that need Um, that that sort of thing but a group of people that don't pray don't do that people that aren't prayerful don't do that so we see that every area so far of the church and what we desire to emulate in the 21st century is first and foremost a result of prayer so we want the Holy Ghost to fall and people be filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts, like Acts 2, well, you got to pray. We want to see miracles, the lame walk. Well, you got to be a prayerful people. We want to see great giving, sacrificial giving, all that, whatever. You need to be prayerful. Um, Acts 5, it continues. The apostles performed uh, many signs and wonders among the people. The believers used, uh, to. they m- met at Solomon's court. And um, as a result of just this continual increase of Christianity and the witness of Jesus, people would bring the sick, lay them on beds and mats, and uh, crowds would gather, and they would bring the sick and the t- those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. That is the result of prayer. You know, uh, 
if, if the Christians weren't praying, word wouldn't continue to spread, and there wouldn't be this continual rise and increase of the power of God being at work through these people. Um, and, and the way that it can only increase is through prayer. So uh, another example is you continue in Acts 5. Um, they're trying to stop it now, the, the religious people, the Pharisees. They've got Peter and John uh, captured in prison, and they're telling them, you've got to stop speaking in the name of Jesus. Quit talking about him. We've killed him. Peter's like, yes, but you know he came back and all of that, so he's alive forever more, and he has all power, and everything is in the name of Jesus. And they're like, stop saying that. And finally, a Pharisee named um, Gamaliel, it was a teacher of the law, and he stands up and he basically just says, if this is of man, it's going to die out. But if it's of God, I mean, how are you going to fight against God? And so then the, the council hears it and they're persuaded by his speech. And so they call the apostles in and they kind of flex on them by having them flogged. And um, then they order them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And then verse 41 of Acts 5, this past, I've said it many times, and this verse still is just unbelievable. The apostles left rejoicing that they had been counted worthy for suffering disgrace for the name. And then, verse 42, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, large gatherings and small gatherings, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah, which is the gospel. They continued in it after they had faced this opposition and this beating and all of that. But that response to being flogged can only come from a person who's prayerful. If you're not prayerful and then you get beat up for Jesus and you get bitter you know haven't I been through enough woe is me all of that that's the response of somebody who's not prayerful but somebody who's prayerful somebody that is constantly in contact with Jesus and in the presence of God and experiencing that the joy of the Lord is my strength and I find that joy in his presence you can endure tribulation, hardship, things that come your way, pressures and persecutions. And because you are in such direct relationship with Jesus, you can go through anything and just thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Doesn't mean it's not going to be difficult at times, but it's perspective. And we see the response of people who are prayerful. We see their response. And... Um, you know, one other thing real quick. You know, you always hear people got to be like the Book of Acts church, which I'm a firm believer in that. But nobody ever goes to that verse as a reason why they want it. We want Acts 2. We want Acts 3. We want the power. We want the millions. We want the, you know, the miracles, multitudes believing. But nobody ever goes to Acts 5.41 and say, I want to be rejoicing that I was counted worthy to suffer shame for the name. Nobody preaches from that. Anyway, that wasn't that was free. That wasn't in the notes, you know. Um, one other, a couple more examples to just continue to kind of brand this into our brain. Acts six, uh, the apostles are getting a little, um, you know, pushback from some of the Hellenistic Jews, the Greek Jews, because the they were uh, complaining that the Hebrew Jews, their widows. Um, were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So they were accusing the apostles of showing favoritism to the Hebrew Jews uh, and the Greek Jew, Jewish widows were uh, getting like um, hand-me-downs, so to speak, of food or missing out or whatever. And the apostles are like, the 12 are like, okay, well, we can't like do everything. And this thing is growing at a rapid pace. And I don't know who got food and who didn't, so we need to just, like, put some people over here to handle the food bank. 
so to speak. And so they're like, well, this is what we need to do. So they gather all the disciples together, and they're like, okay, well, this is what God's called us to do. So it wouldn't make sense for us to leave what God's called us to do to take care of this. Not that any job was more important, but it doesn't do any good to forsake your post to try to fulfill another one. You just need to get more people involved. So they're like, well, let's find seven uh, men among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's what God's called us to do. Let's find other men to step up and fill these other roles. And so um, this is the requirement, though, of basically overlooking the food bank. They had to be full of the spirit. So they found men, Stephen, Philip, um, and the list goes on. You can read about it in Acts 6. But the descriptions of them, they were full of the Holy Ghost. Now, I just have a question. Can you be full of the Holy Ghost and not pray? No. In case anyone was wondering, the answer is no. You can't be full of the Holy Ghost and not have a prayer life impossible like no so we can conclude then from Acts 6 that prayer was a number one requirement to be involved in any level of ministry okay which we're gonna be doing a lot of teaching on ministry and other things in the coming months because we've messed it up and so we're gonna try and fix it um but prayer, once again, right there as a main element. Acts 10, we read about Cornelius, uh, the first non-Jew, Jewish household to receive the Holy Ghost and be baptized. And then the Jews realized, wait, Jesus is for everybody, not just the Jews. And Peter's scratching his head like, did I want this? You know, But uh, we find in Acts 10, verse 9, that it was around noon the next day, and they were headed to the city to find Peter. And it says, Peter went up on the roof to pray. And while he was waiting for lunch, he fell into a trance. Peter gets the direction from God that, hey, you're going to go preach to some Gentiles. Where did Peter get that? In prayer. If Peter would have never went up to pray that day, and those men would have been knocking on the door saying, hey, we want you to come. Peter probably wouldn't have come because they were Gentiles and he was a Jew. And even though he said this is for all people in Acts 2, he didn't quite believe what he was preaching quite yet. So prayer, once again, is a central figure in unlocking the door of salvation to the nations. And if Peter wouldn't have prayed that day, he wouldn't have been sensitive to the voice of God to know this is okay to go ahead and do. So we see, we see how like every pivotal moment in Acts hinges on prayer. And we're, we read where they were praying, but we need to ask the question, what would have happened if they wouldn't have prayed? We probably wouldn't have been reading about them because God would have found somebody else. Acts 16, verses 16 through 18, as I close. We see here in this uh, setting preached from this passage many times but um, <clears throat> Paul and Silas and their companions they go into Philippi and they plant the first church in Europe which was Philippi and they baptize Lydia in her household and then it says once when we were going to the place of prayer we were met by a female uh, who had the spirit of Python, which basically means, you know, uh, is a demonic influence for prophecy. And she comes up, and we know the story. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Well, in a nutshell, in that area, that spirit that possessed that woman was kind of like the prevailing spirit in that area. And when Paul and Silas and their companions go in, into this city, plant a church, baptize a household, and all of that, the spirit gets stirred up. But when did that spirit go out to meet them? 
when they were going to the place of prayer. So we find miracles are connected to prayer. Incredible sacrificial giving is birthed out of prayer. A continual increase of miracle signs and wonders and the city becoming aware of this group of people that love Jesus is revolving around prayer. Appointing new ministries and levels and getting more and more people involved, the prerequisite is prayer. Unlocking the door to reaching new groups of people is connected to prayer. And the enemy gets stirred up when people are praying and reaching other people and baptizing new people and, and harvesting uh, souls in a new city, all of that. And it's all connected to prayer. But on the flip side of things, none of this probably would have ever been done if it hadn't been for prayer. If the people we read about in the book of Acts weren't prayerful, all these incredible stories we read about probably wouldn't have been done. And the reason why we can come to that conclusion is because you can see it played out in the 21st century. Churches that aren't really about prayer aren't really doing much. Churches that have a desire to make prayer the central figure of everything they do and let everything else evolve from that, they're, they're either doing great things because they've been doing it for a while, or they're about to do great things because they're doing it God's way. So you can't deny the fact that as you read through this book and you see how the early church did it specifically, prayer, well, I mean, Paul says it in one of his letters, first pray, first pray. So that's what we have to embrace, not just when we gather together, but every day. If there's one thing that you can do right every day, you're like, well, I can't really do much right so just work on getting one thing right every day. And if you make that prayer, there's going to be a lot more that seems to get better in your life every day. Because you can't go wrong with prayer. You just can't go wrong with prayer. Talking to Jesus, connecting with the Lord, and letting the Spirit of God work in your life and keep you full of the Holy Ghost. And that can only happen through prayer. So tonight, uh, I, I want to challenge us. To every time we gather together here, let us, when we walk through those doors, understand we're praying. And uh, on Sundays, you know, we have coffee at 930. Let's start prayer at 945. Uh, be here 945. Start walking the front. Find a place at a pew. Line up against a wall, whatever. And let's start praying at 945 and just allow this place to be transformed from a cold uh, Presbyterian sanctuary to the house of God, the house of prayer. And let's warm this up with the fire of the Holy Ghost and allow God to do what he wants to do through a group of prayerful people. And I promise you, this year is going to be a year that blows our minds if we can at least get this one thing right.